Thank you all for being here on a Sunday in such appalling weather. But I think when Lisa landed in Delhi, the sky started to clear. Um, I've known her a really, really long time, so this conversation may seem like a conversation between friends who've had parallel lives and different lives. But I hope you'll enjoy the intimacy of what we're going to talk about. What I can tell you about Lisa is she's incredibly private, but equally she shares everything. Uh, my friend of many contradictions, Lisa Ray. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your generous attention and, uh, and for also coming out, as Nonita said, on a, on a day which is, um, you know, yeah, it's appalling weather. You know, it's another one. I, it's something that you can't ignore. Uh, but we live in contradictions in India and, you know, in a strange way, I have to say that maybe that's one of the things that's always pulled me to India is this kind of rawness of being how, you know, um, I, I like saying that for everything you can say about India, the exact opposite is also true. So <laughs> right now we're suffering in this weather and, uh, and then suddenly you'll, you know, pass by a, a beautiful open area and you know something will just take your breath away and it won't be the pollution for a change well what took my breath away was the book um i read it when it first came out in may and then i read it last night and i found i couldn't put it down again um it's it's raw it's savagely honest but it's also almost the strangest book to have as a debu debut novel because it's so incredibly honest and you tell all your stories and it makes me wonder why would you take such a hard decision or such a hard path for your first book? Um, I've, of course, I'm, th I'm really glad that you asked me that question because it gives me a wonderful gateway into sort of explaining a little bit more about who I am. And um, <clears throat> I, I have to, you know, obviously step back a little bit because I think that we do have a tendency to pigeonhole people. You know, no matter who you are and where you're from in life, right? We tend to stereotype people. So, you know, if you're a doctor, you, you, you know, we have certain perceptions about who you might be. And then because I've been in front of the camera since, I don't know, I was 16. 16 a uh, very tender age and you know I'm still shocked that you know <laughs> I'm still up here maybe you know 30 years three decades later um, I think that in a sense I've always had a double life because my career in front of the camera has actually been an accident and I'm not trying to be cute or metaphorical here it was literally an accident and sort of as a direct result of that, I found that I was always, as I said, leading this double life. There's a wonderful saying that, you know, we have a public life, we have a private life, and we have a secret life. And I think that finally, after many years, I wanted to bring all those three lives together, you know, to actually have them be cohesive and harmonize them, which I was not able to do earlier on in my life when I was a younger woman. And <clears throat> so that was sort of one of the motivations behind writing Close to the Bone. And I guess you might say the title also uh, is a play on that, where on one hand, Close to the Bone obviously refers to the bone cancer that I was diagnosed with in 2009. But at the same time, getting close to the bone to me evokes stripping away everything, you know, taking off all of the masks, all of the armor that we wear as human beings and getting very, very close to the essence of who we are. And um, <clears throat> it hasn't always been like that for me. I haven't always been, as you know, because Nonita and I go so, so far back. And I think when I was much younger, it was a lot harder for me to be very honest uh, with others and also with myself, you know? I was always sort of hiding from myself. and. So this process of becoming more honest, um, this process of becoming more authentic and truthful to myself uh, hasn't happened overnight. It's been about 20 years of really hard work. But as a woman, I also felt like I need to be able to share my story. I want to take back my narrative. 
because my narrative had been seized, I think, along the way by so many other forces. You know, first of all, of course, when I first came into the industry, I was like, wow, you might say a sex symbol. Um, you might say this glamorous kind of a figure. And at the same time, I want to emphasize here that while I was experiencing the height of my fame and my recognition in the 90s, I was experiencing my deepest lows emotionally. I was suffering from uh, trauma, from a car accident. I was suffering from very, very low self-esteem. Like you I were suffering from anorexia. I was suffering from an eating disorder, anorexia, bulimia. Basically, I hated myself. So, you know, going through these, this sort of um, extreme experiences, I think at such a relatively young age, kind of set me up for this idea of being an investigator of life, you know, of trying to figure out, look, I have literally, not really on account of any great accomplishment, to be honest, but sort of, you know, timing and good luck of being on the cover and for good looks. And uh, yeah, and, and good looks, well, I want right? to say, I want to say photographic. I photograph really well, and that's a little bit different from just being good looking. I'm, but I'm, I'm serious. You know what's interesting? Because you can sometimes meet people, they're gorgeous in real life, and they, yeah, and photographs are kind of, eh. And then you can meet people who look exactly the same, and me, I don't know, I look fab in photographs. I just like, something happens. But honestly, it has nothing to do, it's just down to genes and it's just down to, you know, proportions on your face, basically. But anyway, so there I was, I was launched on the cover of this magazine. And so suddenly I had experienced fame, money, opportunities, reputation, everything that society tells you is supposed to make you happy, right? That's how we define our success, correct? And yet, you heard the worst things about you. Even before I met you, I'd heard that she sleeps around, she does drugs, she's reached where she has, with most women, as they say, by yeah. sleeping her way up. What was the worst thing you heard about yourself? And with what you've actually told me, I understand why you chose to own your own narrative. You needed to become the investigative journalist of your own life. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Exactly. I mean, but what was the <coughs> worst thing you heard? Because you addressed some of them in the book, but did you address all of them in the book? No, no. I don't, you know, it was just an onslaught. And I think that the most debilitating thing that can possibly happen is for somebody else to tell you who you are. Imagine, right? It's terrible. Somebody else coming up to you and saying, I know who you are. This is who you are. I'm going to tell you who you are. And I was getting that throughout the 90s. And, you know, some people again might say, well, the cost of it was the fame and the money and the this and the that. But what I want to emphasize and say is that I realized that none of that fixed me. At a certain level, absolutely none of it actually healed me. If anything, I was going through my darkest period of time when I was at the height of my fame. So again, it really, really helped me to understand and to question what is success and to set me on the path of redefining success. And also, of course, to like ask the big question. So what is life about? What does this all mean? You know? Um, so it was a very strange circumstances in my life. And my career is literally an accident. I'm shy, and yet, I'm an introvert. Yeah, and yet you had this career which, where you sort of self-sabotaged it. Mm. Every time you became successful, you ran away. You disappeared into Dharamshala. You did long periods of silence. You vanished to London. You tried so hard to be invisible, and yet you stayed visible. Nobody forgot you. Mm. I was in the business, and we kept waiting to find you somewhere so that we could <laughs> photograph you. How did you I think I think that? I think a common friend of ours called me the runaway model. I was like always run, you know, they, they have the runaway bride, and I was the runaway model. I'd be there, and then I'd be gone. And it was my way of moderating myself because 
um, because I'm an introvert and I actually get overwhelmed. Let me explain my, my definition of introvert versus extrovert because I believe an introvert can appear to have extroverted qualities, but you get drained by being around people all the time and an extrovert actually gets energy. So I was an introvert, the classic introvert, and so I would be you know, out in the business as a bit of a workaholic. I was you know, working and surrounded by people and then I would get drained, I would hit a wall. So then I'd have to disappear. On one of my quests, I go up to Dharamshala, I would just like literally disappear. I don't know, I think that I was living through an era, of course the 90s were very different in India, right? Where I think if you had an aura of mystery, it actually worked for you in the business, which is perhaps not the case today. I, I don't know if you would agree with me today. There's almost oversharing. You know, everybody's on social media. We know what Deepika's having for lunch, and we know who's with who and all of this stuff. But, you know, uh, it was a very different time, and it retained a little bit of that of that slight magic, I think, because all the people who were stars or well-known in the 90s, we didn't really know a lot about no, them. The they public were enigmas. didn't. They were yeah. enigmas, much as Bombay was an en enigma for us. Right? Yes. When you walked into Bombay in the 90s, it still was a little dissolute, a little seedy, terribly sexy, mm -hmm. and there you walked in trying to navigate your way. You didn't love Bombay, but you didn't hate it. <laughs> what was your relationship with it then? And I think I have to tell you something really weird. She's back in Bombay. <laughs> I, you know, Bombay is a thank you. I, 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 today I like saying that Bombay is the city that made me, that broke me, that healed me, that remade me so many times over. It's what, like all of these sort of uh, maximum cities um, that they have this extraordinary ability to actually help you confront yourself. You know, it's not so much the city, it's, it's the qualities in yourself that are brought out navigating that city. So there was a lot of that, you know, I, I, I still think of Bombay as sort of, it's my father, you know, it's my father's city. So much in my formative years were also spent there. So from 16 to 30, um, I was there. And I learned so much about myself and about the city. And there's, I, I mean, it's quite a few little humorous things as well, uh, and maybe not so humorous things that I've, that I've uh, written about in Close to the Bone. But I like, you know, in a strange way, I think today, because of Bombay and my early experiences, I say that my mission today, or my job, is to make, how do I put it? To make defying the odds, and to make setting your own path irresistible to all of us. Because we don't always get that message. Right? We are told more than anything to conform. And again, I have always sort of defiantly set my own path again and again and again, and it appears to be a form of sabotage where I didn't actually, um, I didn't put my career as the pinnacle or the apex of my achievement. It was sort of there, and I'd come in and out. But that was because there were other things that I felt were very, very important that were always uh, capturing my attention. Or your and heart, right? Or love. my heart. Love has been such an important part of your book, and I really admire the way you've shared your love stories. Um, a lot of them have heartbreak. Mm -hmm. um, but you've loved deeply and wildly and absolutely illogically. <laughs> uh, and not sensibly. And of course, she's had a very happy love story, yes. a beautiful ending. But how did love propel you? Because I see that as a very common thread through the book. Oh, uh, okay. I'm really glad you picked up on that as well. Um, I was there. Uh, yeah, and, and you were there, of course. Yeah, I have been unapologetically this completely irrational, illogical creature who would fall head over heels quickly in love. And follow that, no matter what everyone around was telling me, no matter what, you know, even my rational mind was telling me. And, you know, quite often it ended in disaster, you might say. And you know what? Here's my take on it. I own it. I don't regret a single one of those experiences because they have made me who I am. And I actually think that... Of course, today I'm tempered a bit, you know, I'm a bit more mellow. I'm in a f beautiful, loving partnership and relationship. But let me also say that the search for love, through whether it was through relationships or whether it was through questing on, uh, you know, a more spiritual search, actually brought me to who I am today. And I, I would 
um, I would actually probably say that my current, my marriage is a result of the fact that finally, at the end of it all, we come back to where we started. And I realized that all the love that I need is actually inside me. And I, thank you. And I cannot emphasize that point enough. But having said that, if I had not thrown myself out there into the world, kissed and actually frogs. kissed all the frogs, but also sampled the buffet, sampled everything that's out there and not just like like you know taking delicate little sips i was actually or you know, taking like full like choking on it i would not be here where i am today and you know even you know they of, of course even buddha of course had to experience um the worldly aspects you know the worldly delights in order to transcend them and uh, I, I'm not saying that I've necessarily transcended, but I'm so much more at peace with this idea of true partnership. And for me, the idea of a real relationship is sharing love. I'm not looking for someone to complete me. I am complete and therefore, I can offer my love up to someone else and then something magical happens. I actually have, a, have something that Jason and I, my husband, we say to each other, my husband's Lebanese. Um, and we like saying that there's Lisa and there's Jason and then there's the us. And that's a separate entity and we feed, right? And we feed into the us and yet we maintain also our individuality and I think that that's what works. I think that, you know, both of us, I think, in, in a strange way have come to this conclusion. We're quite independent and we, we, we still invest in our, <coughs> we're ambitious in a different way. We invest in our, in our work and our career and our relationships, but we keep a part of ourselves separate and I think that's important. Well, I like to say I have ambition and I'm not ambitious because I'm not going to stand on anyone's feet to get somewhere but this is not about me. What I also <laughs> felt about the book is that if it hadn't been for your parents you wouldn't have been able to fly and I love knowing that you had a home to go to because somewhere someone was keeping your poems safe <laughs> because the book has some incredible poetry by Lisa when she was 16, when she was younger, even younger. And you have, uh, you have all of this sort of kept with you. And I looked at some of the poetry you wrote for us at Bazaar and that common voice is just incredible. Tell me a little about your mother, her accident and your beautiful Baba. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think that when we were young, we all somehow think that we are originals. We're the original rebels and our thoughts are original and our decisions are original and nobody can understand us. And it was in writing this book that while I do maintain that I'm someone who defies the rules quite often or makes up my own rules or defies convention, I realized that this is something that was passed on in the blood. This is something that I received from my beautiful Baba and my mother. So my father's Bengali, from a very traditional family in Sham Bazar in Calcutta. And he met my mother when he was a student. Uh, he was studying in England, but he actually went on an exchange program to Warsaw, to the Eastern Bloc, because, you know, all Bengalis were armchair Marxists. I don't know if you know this about them. Maybe they still are a little bit. Um, so they, they, you know, had romanticized the idea of communism. So they went on like some student exchange. I still try to picture my Baba like singing Rabindranath Sangeet to Russians, you know. It's like makes quite the picture. And um, actually on the last night he met my mother in the, uh, in the university in Warsaw. And she could not speak English. And he, needless to say, he could not speak Polish. So I don't know what happened that night, but they kept in touch. And you know what I wanted to add? This is incredible. I actually found their love letters. Can you believe that? I found their love letters that they wrote to each other. So this I've very carefully squirreled away. It's my most precious possession. Now it's going to go into the next book, I'm sure, in some way. But anyway, so they had this really interesting romance. And please remember, this was the 1960s where, you know, my father was told in no uncertain terms that he would, you know, his shadi, his wife, the, uh, uh, a lovely PhD Bengali Brahmin girl had been chosen for him. She was waiting in Calcutta 
And, you know, my mother had never even met anyone from India today. And somehow they kept in touch over three years. And then somehow, I don't even know how she got out of Poland because it was not easy. It was the Iron Curtain. So they had this grand romance. And, you know, they had to defy both of their, their families. Eventually the families came around. But I imagine what, how, what it must have been like in those days. You know, my father came from a fairly well-to-do family, so to actually tell his family, I don't need anything from you. I just know that this is what's right for me, was, I think, an incredibly brave decision, you know, in 1960. And also, you know, for my mother to leave everything that she knew, leave it behind. So they had this incredible romance. And the, on top of that, then they decided one day to leave England. All of this, you know, stability and security and everything that they had established, they just packed up, every, sold everything, packed up everything in three suitcases and landed up in Canada. So, you know, this for me today blows my mind. So today, when I look at my own decisions and choices to constantly change cities, and I have lived in a lot of cities, that's another thing I've shared in Close to the Bone, literally every three years I was changing countries and cities, I understand where that impulse comes from. I really don't judge myself for it. I think it's, again, it's, it's a beautiful thing to accept. It's an alluring thing to be able to accept. You're, I mean, you have to take responsibility for your decisions, and I take responsibility for all of my decisions. I don't play victim for any of it. But I think that, again, the original fiery, rebellious spirit has been passed on by my Baba, and by my mother. So cut to many years later, uh, well, I ha we had just been on vacation in Bombay. I was suddenly, I'm gonna give you the very shortened version. We were on vacation in Bombay. Somebody spotted me at a party. This was 1991. They said, hey, do you want a model? I had never thought about it. I was scandalized. I was scandalized. It's 1991. No respectable girl ever modeled in those days or entered films or anything like that. And I had, I was on track to, you know, go to university. I was, had scholarships and all of that. But you know what? That little curious investigative journalist in me just went, mm. I never thought about it, but okay, let's try it. So I ended up in a photo studio. It was a very, very foreign, alien thing for me. Took these photographs. I was spotted by Maureen Wadia of the Wadia dynasty, the Bombay Dying dynasty. I took all these photographs from her. She was wonderful, very warm and welcoming. I met some wonderful characters. I thought, okay, this is a great experience. I'll tell all my friends back in Canada and they probably won't even believe me. So we left at the end of it, we went back to Canada, and I was supposed to begin university. Until, simultaneously, so basically in the end of August, I was supposed to begin in September, at the end of August, my parents and I were involved in a very serious car accident. And as a direct result of that, my mom lost the ability to walk. And just on that trip, when we got into the car, the, 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 the day of the accident, my mom and I switched seats. And it's something that, you know, serendipity, I mean, how does one rationally explain that? You cannot. Even today, after years later, I can't. There is some karma that we had to burn. But anyway, so this very serious car accident happened. My life was turned inside out, upside down. I had had this beautiful, idyllic life, and I'm an only child, and I couldn't even handle the trauma of it. But imagine this, because at exactly the same time, on the other side of the world, in India, my image was released on the cover of a magazine called Glad Rags. Yes. But in those days, in 1991, how would you know you're famous unless somebody called you? Because... There was no Instagram. Imagine that. There was no Instagram. There was no texting. There was no WhatsApp. There was no internet. We did not know. We were, where we were oblivious. So I always like saying that my career, that's why I call it an accidental career, but another way of looking at it is it started on the edge of a blade. 
on one side was of course fame and and you know instant success and on the other side was very very deep trauma your life is punctuated by strange things like this by trauma um, the strangest was when you were diagnosed I think your mom had sort of a prescient sort of like an idea that you're not well when she was not well she told you to get yourself checked when Lisa gets her diagnosis and the doctor is telling her horrified because she was so young she asks him can I get you a glass of water <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had goosebumps when I read that I said what were you thinking because that was not good news that was the worst news you could get and she's thinking about the doctor and saying can I get you a glass of water because he looked so shattered yeah there was so, like a little bit of sweat going down his <laughs> one side and and the reason was because he announced a diagnosis to me he says and, and he spoke very very slowly he said you have multiple myeloma and I just looked at him and I did not cry and I did not react so obviously when there's this very long pause he got very nervous and he said and it is fatal and it is incurable and this strange chick is sitting here just staring at him not reacting so he started to get more and more nervous you know like I said sweat is coming down his uh, you know one side of his brow and that's when I looked up and I said oh doc are you okay would you like a glass of water and I'll tell you though what was happening in my mind though Here's the thing, I have to go back a few months. Now, I truly do believe that our bodies speak to us. And my body had been trying, trying desperately to get my attention, I think, for months, if not maybe a few years. And I kept overriding those signals, overriding those signals, not listening, closing the door, come again, don't bother me, until finally I was obviously getting the strongest possible message that you can get. Now, you also somewhere, I think, know intuitively when something is not right, you know? And I had been dealing with that for quite some time, you know? I was getting very lethargic, uh, even, you know, I was falling asleep sometimes on sets in the afternoon, so I said, oh, okay, I'll stop eating rice, I'll have more coffee, I'll this, I'll that. I had many excuses in my mind, and the mind is a very tricky, tricky tool, tricky tool, you know? Whereas the mind was telling me everything is okay and just change your diet and everything like that, my body was still trying to break through. So I knew something was wrong. I just knew it. But I did not have the courage to stop and do something about it. Because I had been trained over a lifetime to reject my body's signals by the business that I've been in. Like, let me tell you, when you're on a set and you have a fever, you can't go home, actually. You can't call in sick. Our business is very, very crazy, right? It really uh, kind of makes you override all of your human signals, all of your body signals. So somebody, a doc will be called, he'll come to the set, he'll give you, a, you know, a, an injection, he'll give you some medication, and you continue working. So I've been trained by doing that. Plus, the other thing is, because of this early trauma that I had experienced in my life, I had never actually done the work around it. I'd never stop to deal with the pain, to deal with the pain of what happened during that car accident. So can you imagine for so many decades, what do we do as human beings when we don't want to face something? I'll tell you what I did. I kept busy. I kept so busy and kept running around the world so fast the wind couldn't even chase me down. And that was my way of coping with it until finally, I had to stop. I had to stop, listen to my body, and finally heal and make the changes that my body, my mind, and my heart were asking for. And so in a strange way, this is why perhaps everything happened in a moment. Of course, I blanked out when the doctor told me I have multiple myeloma. I'd never heard of it in my life. I, I couldn't even pronounce it properly. But I had also blanked out because something in me, some switch went off. And I said, now is your time of reckoning. Now your real journey into healing begins. And I knew instinctively that this was not the end for me. I was not going to die. I can't explain how I knew that, but I knew. Like it was a deep knowing. And I knew that this was not going to be easy, 
but that now, as I said, finally, this was my one chance to heal and to take the steps to live my very, very best life, finally. And it pretty much, <clears throat> it's pretty much sort of the reason this book started. She started a really lovely blog called The Yellow Diaries. Uh, I remember I was in another magazine and we asked to publish it. Um, but I have to tell you, this is not a book about cancer. Um, for those of you who've not read it, I have to remind you that this is not a book about cancer. This is just a book that started her journey as a writer. Uh, and it, makes me, it gives me great pleasure to tell you that she signed a three-book deal with HarperCollins. Yes. There are three more books Thank coming, you. three more chances for us to talk to Lisa and hear her stories. I'm going to end with asking you, Lisa, because there are a lot of young writers and everyone has a story in them. Tell us a bit about the process of writing, because that's really important. You've lived in all these lives. Mm. She had two babies. She had twins on the way, souffle, through surrogacy, which is something that Lisa is a huge advocate of. How did you find the time to write? Just leave us with that, and then I know people have a lot of questions for you. So I want to also share this um, and also leave you with this, that I believe that... I have always been a writer. I am a writer. Everything else has been wonderful. It's been a wonderful diversion, but my true calling is that of a writer. So I think number one, you have to own it. You have to, it's also not about being published necessarily. Of course, that's the end goal. But when you're a writer, first of all, you have to love reading and you have to love words, and you have to love sentences, and you have to love putting together words into sentences. And so I've always had a passion for language and reading and all of that. That has never escaped me. I remember back in the 90s when we didn't have smartphones sitting on the set and I'd always have a book in my lap. Um, <clears throat> so I think that, of course, like the genesis of this book is crazy. I won't go into it in too much detail right now. But yeah, I rewrote the entire book in the last year and a half, and I was so uh, happy to have HarperCollins India uh, publish it and be my partner. And I actually withdrew it from another publisher because they didn't believe in my voice and how I wanted to tell my story. So I would say that, you know, for writing, it, it's a vocation. It's a calling. It, it's not, I mean... I also often say it's not the time I spend at my desk. It's, a, it's the time that I spend just literally in that mind space. You know, I'll be walking around and suddenly something will, I'll get a thought and I write it down, I scribble it down. It's about collecting those thoughts and, those, those, and inhabiting a kind of a space. So a lot of the process for me happens outside the actual sitting down and writing. But you also have to be organized, right? I think the day before you, have you went to, be to get the babies, you, you handed your manuscript in. This is how efficient she is. For all <laughs> the flaking out or pretending she's yeah. vanished, she's secretly working all the time. No, I, I had to be, you know. I mean, deadlines are a very good thing. They're very scary, but they're a very good thing. And I think I was completely consumed for the last six months. I sat and I probably worked for like eight hours a day. But also my husband has an interesting story to tell where he'd like wake up at like three o'clock in the morning to use the bathroom and he's like, uh, where's my wife? She's not here. And go downstairs and I'd be writing away. So I, 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 I mean, discipline is extremely important. Extremely important, sticking to deadlines, treating, treating writing with the respect that it deserves, you know? It's a profession, it's a very, very serious vocation, calling, art, and profession, all in one. So you need to be disciplined, you need to actually meet your deadlines. Um, but I get a little bit obsessive about it, to be honest, in, in the last stretch. So I was, I remember like sitting and I would, was very bad company I'd be sitting at a dinner and I'd be like sitting there going have people are having a conversation I'd be nodding 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 and be like hang on a second hang on a, hang on and I can't because suddenly a thought would pass through my mind and I'd have to write it down carry a notebook I always carry a no well a notebook or of course now you know it's my um, my uh, phone but also remember oh, and uh, the other thing that is your biggest enemy I would say is perfection I call it the pathology of perfection. And that actually, I think, uh, applies to everything in life. 
You know, I've written about that in the context of also my business and how we scrutinize women and how we objectify women and expect them to look a certain way, particularly when you're in front of the camera. And that's a certain pathology of perfection that I've been trying to break with. But also with writing, it's terrible. That's the, I, I would say, wouldn't you say, Nonita? Like uh, that perfect, like search of the perfect sentence is the death of me. Is the death, and and you can go back, but you've got to just spill it out on the page, and then remember you can go back and. But edit. also the death of me is punctuality, and we have run out of time. Okay, <laughs> um, I'm really sorry, but I know that she gets it. We have time for two or three questions. So, who would like to ask something? Uh, you said that you are an introvert. Do you feel that the fact that you are an introvert? helped you to blossom as a writer because reading and writing requires a lot of seclusion yes. and uh, distractions, they take away the valuable time which is so precious to you. That's an excellent question and uh, I won't necessarily, I, I'm not in a position to say that introversion and writing exclusively go together, but I do feel that my essential nature of being an introvert and also I like to spend time together uh, on my own. I like to spend a lot of solitary time on my own, but I also like to watch. I like to be the person in the room to be standing on the you know, side towards, and just watch people. And that comes maybe also out of being an only child. So I would say that the introversion and the, the, the stillness and the fact that I'm an only child has helped me to write my book and will hopefully continue supporting me in my writing career. Hi, I'm Rajesh Segal. You said in 91 when you try modeling, it was a very difficult time and it was not, uh, people think it a respectable profession. And since long time in India, sports and films uh, are being seen by parents, not a good profession. So what do you think at present, what is your message to the society that today's young people should follow sports, films, modeling as a career? What do you want to say to the parents? I would say, um, to be honest, it's not also just about sports or film or modeling and all of that. And I think that we have progressed today to a place, to a position in India where it has become a lot more, it's a more institutionalized career, modeling and acting, there's agencies, and it, it's, it's a lot more seen as a serious career. I, don't, I think it's lost that or of disrespectability in, in one sense. But I would also share that this is an era, hopefully, um, more than any other era that's come before where it really is about following your passion, really, really finding what satisfies you. And again, redefining success, as we said. You have to ask yourself, you know, you cannot, I, I mean, in this generation, this young generation, and I'm quite happy to see, I can share with you that today, because I'm still, you know, doing some acting and I'm still in the business on the periphery, that I meet so many young girls today in Bombay and it's actually very heartening because they've come from all over India and they're independent and they're very responsibility, uh, responsible and they're following their dreams. And I've never seen it as such a mass movement. I'm talking about my personal generation because the world has changed so much and India has changed is finally the time to really really follow your dreams first of all you have to ask yourself what is it that makes me happy not makes other people happy you know the only I would say the only trap about getting into a business like sports is a different thing it requires a lot of discipline but uh, say something like modeling or acting now it takes a lot of work again people don't realize that it's a very very difficult profession in terms of the work that is required it's not at all glamorous when you're behind the scenes but the only thing is some people fall into it for this idea of validation because they want to get some form of validation or attention from the world and I would say think about that many times because it's such a, it requires so much dedication and hard work. And if you're going into the profession for that, it will make you even more insecure. So I would encourage, today our generation is much more self-aware. So work on yourself. Understand, what, ask yourself those questions. What makes me happy? Why do I want to do this? Is it because I want attention from other people? Because there's better ways of getting attention, believe me, than going into one of those professions. In your journey of life, what do you think was more, uh, was a more enjoyable phase? 
uh, fame at such a tender age or uh, you writing this lovely, lovely book? That's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. I really have to say um, that I have really enjoyed every single phase. And I think it's really, uh, it's my perspective on life. And I want to tell you that, you know, we obviously as human beings, we label things. This is a good experience. This is a bad experience. But somehow I have managed to train myself not to judge the experience I'm in. I understand that even if maybe you perceive it as a failure or a bad experience, I understand I get the most out of the experience. I still have this unique ability to be in it and yet be watching it. So every single part of my life has been very rich. But let me, let me not give you a cop out. I am loving being 47 years old, writing my first book, being a mother, still acting, living my best life and being very comfortable in my skin today and being able to be up here and to address all of you is, I, I wanna say I'm, I am humbled. I am filled with gratitude. I'm full of gratitude for your kind attention and for every, every one of the gifts that life has given me. Thank you, Lisa. I'm getting teary. I can tell you what makes me happy, this book. Read it, trust me. That's all. Thank you, Lisa. Thank that you, thank you.